The International Olympic Committee has the honor of announcing that the 21st Olympic Winter Games in 2010 are awarded to the city of Vancouver. This is my perfect city, Vancouver, Canada. We got parks, we got mountains, we got ocean. To top it all off, we got the Olympics. Could this actually be the best city in the world? Vancouver has been chosen by an influential British magazine as the world's most livable Vancouver city. Vancouver has come out on top in a survey of 130 cities around the world. It's really not hard to see why Vancouver is considered one of the best. This is the fifth year in a row that Vancouver has topped this list. But take one wrong turn and you're in the roughest area in North America. Vancouver's downtown east side guest. <laughs> Just got a bottle broken over my head. Who the fuck threw that? As I was saying, this is the roughest neighborhood in North America. One out of every three homeless people living here have AIDS. Two out of three people have Hep C. And it has the highest crime rate per capita in North America. Living conditions are on par with Botswana, Africa, a third world country. How can this place be known as the best city in the world? The disparity between this neighborhood and Vancouver's reputation as one of the world's most livable cities is is disturbing. We have this horrible secret that is the downtown east side. The most concentrated area of drug use in all of North America. Many people aren't aware that this community experienced the most explosive HIV epidemic ever seen in the developed world. Alcohol, drugs, HIV, hepatitis C in the last decade, that's what we're seeing a lot of. How, as a society, did we get into this situation in the first place? And all this mess, what am I doing to help my city? Well, I wake up, I sing, I study, and I stress, but I don't make a difference. Sure, sometimes I talk about the issues with friends at school, patting my academic ego with stats from the morning's paper, but as always, that frail state of caring dissipates. Gotta go back to class, lunch, nap, dinner, movie, sleep. It's all so familiar. But one day, everything changed. While having lunch with a friend on the force, I presented my opinion on homelessness. Living on the streets is easy. They don't wanna work. They're a bunch of scammers. You know, they can get a job like everybody else and work at nine to five. They don't wanna do that. You know, they got everything they need just living there on the street. You got no idea, man. I say, what you wanna do? Go down there for 30 days. You know, all my friends say, I wanna go on some crazy vacation. I say, you know what? Go get a room down there and then we'll see what it's all about. He went on about the gang wars, drug busts, shootings, but I wasn't listening. All I could hear was one tiny, horrible word. Go. I couldn't shake it. School, work, rent, go. get HIV, shot, stabbed, go. By the time the beer hit my lips, it was decided. For 31 days in December, I will conduct a social experiment on myself. I will totally abandon my predictable life and attempt to survive the streets of Vancouver, leaving behind my possessions, identity, friends, and family. My goal is to confront the challenges of street life firsthand, so I see how hard it really is. This experiment, I hope, will shed light on a crisis that is spiraling out of control. And well, instead of crossing a bridge downtown, I'm swimming. So I start my journey freezing, wet, and naked. I arrived downtown with nothing but a backpack with a hidden video camera inside. The temperature was around the freezing mark, but thankfully the rain stopped. My first challenge was to find city services offering food, shelter, and clothing. I had no idea where to look, so I went to Granville Street to ask the locals. Someone had to know. Hey you guys, 
Do you guys know a place right here where I can get some uh, free food and shelter? Do you know where I can get some free food and shelter? <laughs> no idea. No idea? Hey man, do you know where there's uh, any place where I can get food and shelter around here? Well, there's a gun and there's just two blocks. Two blocks down? Thanks a lot, man. Enter the gathering place, a resource center for the homeless. When I walked through the door, they told me I was hypothermic and threw me into a hot shower. They gave me some clothes and told me to go talk to the guy at the front counter when I was done. So, so tell me everything I got. You get everything that we do in the place. So you can be able to go into the laundry room, the pool room, the video game room, the showers, the um, clothing donation area, jacuzzi, run fitness classes. What about yoga? Do I get yoga? Uh, we have a yoga uh, class. I couldn't believe all the luxury services there were for the homeless. This place had live music, snooker, martial arts, and let's not forget the therapeutic hot tub. The mineral-rich hydrotherapy relaxed my muscles. All right, enough fooling around, I'm starving. And lucky for me, December is Christmas time and all the charities are loaded with good food. When I finally found the place on my first night's menu, turkey, gravy, mashed potatoes, corn, all washed down with a hot chocolate and apple crumble pie. Next, I had to find somewhere to sleep. I asked around and Matt, a homeless guy, helped me out. He told me he was staying at a really nice place, the Yukon Homeless Shelter. So I tagged along and got a bed. Since he didn't want to be on camera, he agreed to film me. All right, it's time to do laundry. Laundry's pretty simple. Boom. Leave it by the door here. Come pick it up, cleans it. The next time I see that, everything in there will be clean. Beautiful. Can't go wrong when you're homeless. Okay. All right, well, it's time to go to bed. <laughs> there you go. Oh. Quality treatment. I'm never going home. <laughs> so at the end of day one, I had accomplished a lot. Food, shelter, clothing were all taken care of. I even had yoga. The next morning, I felt fantastic. My bed was really comfortable, and breakfast and coffee waited downstairs. But first, it's time for a bubble bath. <laughs> so now that I'm fresh and clean, I went out on the town to talk fashion with the locals. Based on my appearance, what would you guess that I do for a living? I'll be working in one of these stores. Hmm, I would think you work in a bureau or something. Your shoes suck. My sock is worth more than your entire outfit. They got this smile, but none of the white is happening. Yeah. Get some color happening, buddy. Yeah, yeah. Like it's freaking dying out there. Dying. <laughs> Get some fuck. There it is. If I want to live off people's handouts for the rest of the month, looking like a gay fashion coordinator isn't going to cut it. I had to develop a daily routine for getting dirty. Let's get dirty. All right, here we are at uh, 2088 Yukon Street, home of Vancouver's finest homeless people, including Misha right here. These guys would have taken you in, though, with a regular jacket. <laughs> we know. Oh, here, here's trouble, here's trouble. How do you like living in a homeless shelter? Oh, I'm loving it, I'm loving it. Building social housing and housing bumps generously is not going to solve the problem. It's going to create an additional influx of thousands and thousands of people who want to lead this kind of life should not make such a life tempting. A big reason the guys at the shelter are so happy is because today is welfare day, and I want a piece of the action. This is how you do it. Step one, go to the welfare office. There you will be told to get diagnosed for a mental illness, which will grant you welfare without having to seek employment. Without this diagnosis, you'll have to prove you've been looking for a job, and that's way too much work. Step two, Check into your local mental health center and get your diagnosis. Now this is the tricky part. How does a guy without a mental illness get diagnosed with a mental illness? Easy. Just tell the doctor you're always depressed. She'll diagnose you with chronic depression, give you a handful of happy pills, and send you on your way. Step three, fill out the welfare application at your local library. Step four, the application will require the signature of a landlord who will rent to a welfare recipient. No problem. 
Step five, cash welfare check at your local money mart. Step six, spend all the money on something essential. When you're hungover, there's nothing like a greasy burger. And after gorging myself at a community barbecue, I bumped into Gerald, the self-declared lyrical gangster of East Vancouver. Gerald's right. I've been living on the street for 10 days now and I still don't fit in. It's because my life here is really easy. Whenever I want free clothes, I go get them. Whenever I want free food, I go to the charities. You know, I even ride the bus for free. Just get on, say I have no money, it's easy. Now the thing I don't get is why a lot of the homeless don't use these free services on the regular. Why make life so hard on yourself? I don't know. But maybe if I make life a bit harder on myself, I'll find the answer. So no more bubble baths. It's time to make money the hard way, by working for it. Besides, my welfare check's spent, and the boys say the big money's in squeegeeing. So I stole one and got to work. Although profitable, squeegeeing was abusive, dangerous, and demeaning, so I thought I'd try panhandling. Panhandling wasn't my gig. I didn't make that much money, plus it was boring and cold. So why not search for empties in the city's bins? After all, one man's garbage can be another man's pleasure. I need some privacy. Camera on for a second. Turn it off. I got cut up and stinky for low pay. You rifle through dog crap, vomit, use condoms, trying to find anything of value. Get pricked by a diseased needle and you're dead. I asked Brian how he felt about binning. He showed me there's dignity in it. Like I don't do crime no more, I don't steal, right? This is, uh, I'm gonna tell you something. This is a, kind of like a lifesaver for me. Yeah, it really is. I know that sounds retarded to the average guy. It's a funny thing, why don't you just do a sloppy job? For now, this, this is all the out Yeah, it really has. Whether the public knows it or not, yeah. this is saving the public big money because it costs like 80 grand to keep a guy in prison. So if the guy's not, you can't do this. Like if they take the bottles away, pop the alleys or whatever, yeah. uh, just save a lot of money. Yeah, like if you figure out the money, I've been out for 11 years. Since uh, 97, I got out. So. If you figure out the amount of money that I've saved, basically it's, by bidding, it's, it's saving the government, saving the public. It really is. Yeah. If you recycle 88 million pages so far, 88, 88 million? Yeah. And that's been hanging up here since I've been here. This Bottle Depot was founded by a binner and serves only downtown east side residents. And believe me, it gets used. It generates $2 million a year for the binners. Just one more inch worth of recycling. All of that. With the little money I made binning, I decided to treat myself. Double Big Mac meal, supersized, six McNuggets and a large hot chocolate. And that's when I met Captain Tom. Oh, 
Well, I think Vancouver is an interesting but disturbing social experiment. Policymakers convinced many people working with the mentally ill that they would take the mentally ill out of institutions like Riverview. In 2005, Riverview, one of the largest mental hospitals in North America, transferred thousands of patients into downtown Vancouver. Expected to be more independent, the mentally ill would go unsupervised, live in a more home-like setting, and become part of the community like a normal citizen. Unfortunately, they were basically left to fend for themselves. The community supports weren't there. The community mental health agencies were overrun and understaffed and inability to meet demand. And people ended up coming here, just like people always have, to find cheap, affordable housing. When I returned to the Yukon shelter, they told me my time was up. They sent me away with a list of other emergency shelters. I had no idea what I was in for. If you want to pick 10 things that determine why people are healthy or unhealthy, well, housing makes the list every single time. And the housing that is available to most people living in poverty is completely substandard. You know, when you have a large number of people sharing a single space and you have this increased prevalence of infectious diseases, it is a risky place for some people, and that's what we see in the hospital. People are getting infections in their skin and their legs, also pneumonia, gastroenteritis. Bed 40? Is that oh, no, no. No? Shit. Bed 50. Okay. Uh, you guys have to get your bed straight off here. All right. From down the hallway, I hear a symphony of horking phlegm and blaring rock and roll. The smell of fermenting feet and bed bug pesticide made me gag. Guys were vomiting in the bathroom sinks. The lineup was 30 minutes long to use the washroom. How on earth could anyone sleep in here? I can see why a lot of the homeless prefer to sleep outside. Some hated the stink, others the snoring. For me, it's the phlegm. The guy in the bed next to mine spat mouthfuls onto the floor all night. It was absolute torture. In the morning, thank God for the morning, I bumped into Stuart and asked his opinion on the shelters. I don't like shelters, they remind me of the prison too much. Yeah. The attitude, the atmosphere, it's the same thing as prison. A couple nights later, I began puking and had explosive diarrhea. The lady at the desk nodded like she'd seen this before and checked me into emergency right away. keeping other people up. All you just care about is feeling better. It really brings things into perspective. The doctor took forever. When he did arrive, he had bad news. I had a severe case of gastroenteritis, a viral infection causing inflammation in the stomach and intestines. Symptoms include diarrhea, vomiting, headache, fever, and abdominal cramps. He gave me some codeine, a whack load of T3s and sent me on my way. I need to find shit to make my bed because I'm not going back to the emergency shelter. The doctor told me I can uh, get even more sick and I'm not getting more sick. 
so I'm sleeping on the street from here on in. And I'm trying to find shit with this, uh, trying to find any kind of bedding with this wonderful music in the background. What is this shit? This is kind of weird. Holy fuck! Holy shit, there's a fucking rat in there. That's disgusting. Well, this will be great for uh, sleeping on. Some cardboard. Jackpot. Does it have all the wheels too? Well, kind of. Yeah, that's the catch. That's the catch. This guy's shit. Perfect. I got my blankets. Alright, well, this is where I'm going to bed. It's as good as any. Stomach hurts. I feel bloated. I have to go to the washroom. This is just gross. There's piss all around me. And there's junkies everywhere. I want to get out of here. Let's go. I'm going to go find uh, a nice place where I can actually get some sleep. This is, this is too gross. I can't sleep here. Because I felt so sick, I had no appetite. This made things easy. That is until the clouds rolled in with the Vancouver rain. I couldn't find a good spot under cover. I just wanted to sleep. Oh, look at that. It's like the fucking jackpot of emergency shelter. It looks like a cave. And it looks like we have a visitor as well. Another, uh, obviously, uh, the residents of homeless person X and Y, so time to be Zed. I'm gonna look at this. This is like, this is like too good. It looks contrived. Fuck it. It was Christmas Eve, and all I wanted was a bed to sleep on, so I cheated. On a prayer, I went to the Yukon shelter, and somehow got a room. Yes, an entire room. The sleep was simply glorious. When the morning came, I cleaned myself up, went downstairs, and what do you know, Santa gives presents to the homeless too. All of these presents came from local charities, so it's time to cash in. Jacket, looks like a nice jacket too. Please. That looks like a nice fleece. Yeah. 
Yeah. Steve, you got something to say? I, I just went <laughs> for an extra cold. And an extra pants, and an extra. <laughs> we're fucking going down there. We're going to be hey. loaded today. And you see this beautiful thing right here? Uh, it doesn't fit him. It doesn't fit me, so I'm going to have to sell it. And, uh, <laughs> sponsor my little habit. Um, it, and the retail price is 110 rock for one jacket. So, no, I'm not in favor of just throwing money at them. If you get too generous about this, we create ecological niches that actually compel them to this kind of life. So all those people who have bleeding hearts and say people really have no choice, they are born in a certain socioeconomic class and that determines where they will end up, should remind themselves that that also commits them to saying an incentive structure that makes it easy to become a bum determines that these people will make those bad decisions. You guys think most of these guys spent their Christmas gifts on crack? No, I no. think, no, I'm Steven, I think all of those guys did. <laughs> yeah. do, you, do you think they do it every Christmas? I think every year, yeah. yeah. Most of them are, not all though. Birthdays, not all. I think most of them, yeah. And I think um, that's the only reason we're really happy right now is because if the four of us were walking over the bridge and we had no drugs, no money, and no merchandise to sell, we wouldn't be this happy. No, we wouldn't be filming it. One of us would yeah. probably be trying to say the other from jumping off this bridge. <laughs> That's the way it is. There's not a lot of legitimate opportunities for people to, to make money sometimes. And of course, there's a shadow economy or a street economy that uh, operates all around this. This is the system that people are, are navigating or maneuvering within. Whether I like it or not, the homeless share a unique top priority, something I've never tried. Hardcore drugs, specifically crack and heroin. I can't hide from this reality anymore. So for the last six days of my journey, I'm gonna get high with the rest of them. Like everything else, to truly understand it, I have to do it. Wish me luck. Vancouver has one of the world's most notorious open drug scenes, and it's been that way for a long time. It's very unique here because in other cities there's not such a concentration of people who um, are using illicit substances or illicit drugs. When people visit Vancouver from big American cities uh, that have large drug problems, they're always shocked how, by how open it is here in Vancouver. Everything's just, you know, right out on the street. I went to meet the guys in Crack Alley where they said they'd be getting their fix. When I arrived, it was full of addicts, but hard to find what I was looking for. Yeah, well, don't do it, because I'm not going to let you do it. Because it'd be stupid. It'd be an idiot to do that. Here, give me that later. Okay, yeah. say, say you smoke that crack, and then you, you, and then you smoke it every once in a while, and like you have start skipping phone, school. <laughs> then you'll never, you'll never pass your class. Yeah. And then you're all, you have to think of it like that. Yeah. Just don't put that camera on anybody else over here. We didn't want to mess around, so we went over to the other side. And that's where I met Crystal, the matriarch of the alley. She hooked me up with crack. So this is too much? Yeah, you know what, I'd say a I'm homeless and high in the nastiest alley in the city. But now I feel at home. Suddenly these drug addicts, these complete strangers, seem like family. <laughs> yeah, I love rock. I was only 15 years and I have no idea. Yeah, you have one. Wow. Yeah, you know Yeah, that's really nice. I come from a good family. My dad's a doctor. My mom's an accountant. I was adopted. My sister was murdered by Robert Picton. She had an addiction. I ended up coming down here. I'm here downtown east side because I choose to be. It's, it's an addiction. Getting off of Hastings is as hard as getting off crack. 
Hallucinations is a drug in itself. But now the high's gone, changing the alley back to the sad place it really is. I want more. But luckily, Humphrey was dealing crack right next to me. While hooking me up with the 10 Rock, Humphrey told me how he ended up down here. And one day, um, I had some friends over to my house. And out of courtesy, I took out some dope and I gave it to them. My fiance was coming home from a weekend in Whistler. And uh, she worked for a law firm, a prestigious law firm down town. And she was like, what's going on? And I'm like, you know, I couldn't say anything, I was so fucking high. I had three balls of fucking dope cooked and hidden on top of the dresser. You know, and she's like, I can't stay here, I can't stay here. So she leaves and I'm there thinking, oh great, she'll be back. Like, her parents lived on Grand Island and uh, she went to her parents' house. And the next thing you know is that when she came back, she came back to pack herself. I could understand the addiction to heroin yeah. and people getting sick. But it's a drug that you need, right? It's, it comes to the point that you don't want it. Like, you, you literally cannot move. It's a piece of food. You know what I mean? Yeah. The first time I did it, it was the most amazing feeling I ever had that I puked for like 60 hours. Ugh. And every time I puke, it was more high. You feel really, so you look yeah. forward to puking. Uh, yeah, now I do. Like, it's really good to But I did the other day right there on that corner. And you know what? Nobody called 911 because they had dope. They were digging me. I had no heartbeat. I was in pain. Um, I, you can be content. I can be content like, doing, my, doing my hero. The addictive liability of these drugs is evident in how much health-related harm and suffering people are willing to endure as a result of their drug use. People think that, you know, simply throwing more police and throwing people in jail will actually deter people from seeking that reward of their high. If you're willing to die for the high, well, going in jail isn't gonna stop it either. To watch the police roll up and watch a bunch of people that are injecting scatter, you can really see that it doesn't have much impact on the problem, it's basically displacing it. And I've heard some police officers uh, refer to this as, as shoveling water. As Crystal predicted, I felt horrible and cold. So I bundled up and took a breather. Coming down from crack is that feeling when the world hates you and all you want to do is cry. But knowing my next objective, she gave me a goodbye present, heroin. She told me to go shoot up at Insight, a government run clinic for injection drug users. Always controversial, this experiment has plotted conservatives against liberals tangled in debate. In my opinion, supervised injection is not medicine. It does not heal the person addicted to drugs. Each and every injection, along with the heroin and cocaine injected, harms the person. And government-sponsored supervised injection sends a very mixed message to young people who are contemplating the illicit use of drugs. Thank you, and I'd be happy to take your question. Given that the insight was peer-reviewed by 21 peer reviews from international peer reviews following international principles of research, did the minister have his report from his advisory council similarly peer reviewed? Quick answer, yes or no. Uh, was it yes or no. No. It, was it wasn't for publication. The, the minister speaks very much about the fact that this does not work. Insight was set up to look at a very high risk population of users. These are the people who will not go to treatment. These are the people who have the highest incidence of infectious diseases because of the intravenous drug use. These are the people who needed help and who were dying. My brother, the producer of this film, did not like the idea. Heroines? Are you out of your fucking mind? No. You're well, not doing it. Why not? Why wouldn't I do heroin? Because the most fucking addictive drug niche, you're retarded. I just did crack. I'm not worried about getting addicted to crack. I'm not coming back to Hastings a week from now looking for heroin. Like, I'm not doing that. That's, that's ridiculous. I'm not gonna run back here by myself without you and just go shoot up. Like, you don't have we're to doing do heroin. You don't have to do this, you shouldn't do it. Yeah. Well, no, that's not true. No, I it should is do true. It. This is retarded, Mish. We're doing, You're doing heroin. No. Don't. Are you fucking stupid? No. Okay. Well, we're doing it. Let's go. Enter Insight. This is the first and only safe injection site in North America. 
Inside these doors, users are no longer punishable by drug laws. They inject their drugs with the help of government-funded medical staff. This place serves over 600 addicts a day. Cameras are prohibited here, so we went undercover. Okay, no turning back now. Now I'm starting to get scared. You know, I was hoping she would break the needle or that the cops would come in and shut the place down, but none of that happened. Instead, she just gave me the needle and I was on my way. injection site may be the first time that the drug addict comes into contact with healthcare workers who are not judging him and are hostile to him and are trying to change him. Th that non-judgmental contact gives people an opportunity to consider addiction in a new light. And so harm reduction is not only about specific techniques, it's also about meeting people where they are. How are you feeling, man? To be honest, out of it. But I'm cogent. I'm not having difficulty speaking. But uh, I do feel like I'm floating on a cloud. It's actually pretty awesome. Yeah? Yeah. But it's not as intense as I would have thought. Like, I'm still Misha Kleider, and I... Yeah, I'm not... I, I figured it would make you insane or something. Okay, come roll over. I want to take you on a magical journey because I know a lot of you are never going to have this experience. I don't expect a lot of my viewing audience to do heroin. If I can express this at all well, oh boy. it's like cruising on a cloud. My legs hurt. Typically, my legs don't hurt right now. I have a, I have a um, lower back problem that has cleared right up. As soon as, like before the needle left my arm, I could feel just... I can feel the pain in my lower back disappear, like completely. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful experience, actually. Yeah. I feel dizzy. I feel like I need to puke or something. Come on, let's 
go for a walk. Dude, seriously? I don't know why you did that. It's making me dizzy looking at you. I feel like there's like little baby ants and popping with their fucking eggs underneath my fucking beard or something. Okay, I don't know if I got bullshit stuff or what out, but honestly, I'm not feeling any like real cool sensation right now. Like past like the first 10 minutes, that was nice, but now I'm just feeling like my skin's all fucking itchy. I feel like there's little like ant baby fucking hatchlings under my fucking skin, especially on my arm right here where that fucking needle went in. Honestly, you can do whatever the fuck you want, but I'm going home because I'm done with this shit. Keep playing it, whatever, you can follow me home, but I'm going home. I'm not living out on the street for any longer. Yeah, please, 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 please. What? Come on. Seriously. Let's do this. Five more days, you can do it. Let's go back to the side. First of all, you can't tell me I have to do it. You can't fucking tell me that because you're not the one doing this. I'm the one who's doing this, right? I'm the one that has to do all this fucking bullshit and it's actually annoying. You keep on saying, you know, all this crap to me. I'm fucked in the head right now. I can't even talk straight, but I'm going home. I'm done. Hey. Come on. What? Five more days. We're not doing this, Al. I know. I know what five more days is going to do. But look, look, retard, shut up for a second. Hey, hey, shut up. Hey, let me speak for a second, okay? What's five more days going to do? What's five more days going to do? I fucking did the street stint. I'm fucking done. Done. I'm fucking done this shit. Fuck you! You, don't have, you didn't have days. to fucking do this, okay? You observed this shit. I fucking did it, so fuck you. Fuck you. Five more days, pussy. You still want to do this? Mish. Are you sure you want to quit? Does it look like I want to quit? The answer is yes, Alex. Alright. Fuck it. Dude, let me see. Let me see your eyes. Alright, gang. Are you sure you want to do this, man? Last call, bro. I know. Come on. Exactly. Last call. Good night. I passed out as soon as my head hit the pillow. I then had the worst sleep of my entire life. I had cold sweats, I was short of breath, and I actually looked forward to vomiting because it woke me from the nightmares of the last month. Then, the sun hit my face, and the bad dream was over. Projects fail. <laughs> right? I don't know. Can we salvage this? What happened? So, has your opinion changed about the homeless? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the problem is just so much more complicated than I initially thought. And yeah, I just wrote them off as scammers before for the most part, and they're not scammers. Even people that are panhandling and stuff like that, like there's some issue they have with them. If you could boil it all down to just one thing, one issue, what would it be? Addiction. Addiction is definitely the common thread that unites that whole scene, you know, for everybody I met. You know, I didn't meet anyone that wasn't addicted to something. Yeah. Not a single person when I think about it, actually, that I met down there was addiction free. The global approach to trying to deal with drugs is headed up by the United Nations Office on Drug Policy and the International Narcotics Control Board. Their goal was to to one day uh, create a drug-free world. And I think uh, that's a fantasy. I think it really illustrates just the magnitude of the problem 
with addiction, that it's really the plague of our time. In a capitalist society, in a liberal society, we accept that this is not a solvable problem. But there'll always be people that are like leaves in the wind of social pressure. They'll go the path of least resistance. And if that path is getting high today, and the devil they care of tomorrow, they'll close their eyes and blindly go into that trap. Given that we live in a culture is addicted, as everybody says, to oil, where we engage in the pursuit of the amenities and luxuries provided by oil, despite the fact that we're destroying the earth. Who are we to tell the addict that they shouldn't be engaging in self-destructive behavior? In other words, it's a scapegoating. We're deeply related to the addict. We just don't want to see the relationship. So we ostracize him and banish him to the social periphery. So, the experiment is complete, and what did I find? Life on the street is easy when you're healthy, clean, and living off all the free services. But the street catches up with you, and when you're sick and on drugs, it's a nightmare. The only difference is that I was able to wake up from it. I'm left wondering, is there any hope? One man seems to think so. During the completion of this film, Vancouver voted in a new young mayor. This is Gregor Robertson, and this is the best day of his life. We started this campaign by talking about homelessness, and tonight I'm going to finish right where I started. We are going to end homelessness in Vancouver. Yes! Like you, I have one simple question. How? The most economical way to do this and the most just way to do this is to focus on housing and healthcare supports attached to that housing. It'll be more affordable and, and it'll be better life for, for thousands of people in Vancouver. I lived on the streets for almost a month. I tried the hardest drugs out there, crack, heroin. One thing that became very clear was that addiction is a major cause of homelessness. So if you're gonna solve homelessness, you need to solve addiction. The addiction challenge is, is very difficult for us. It's a tough one to, to break. And uh, we're seeing some success now with the shelters and, and, ta and basically saying it's okay, you can come in if you're still using. You can use these shelters too, at least get a good meal and get eight hours of sleep. But 95% of addiction treatments fail. And what's gonna happen when you provide all these homeless addicts with free housing? Instead of dying from their addiction on the street, they're gonna die from addiction in the free homes that you're giving them. But they're still gonna die. That seems like a band-aid and not a solution. Well, it's a band-aid, but if, uh, if people are literally dying on the streets, you gotta, you gotta look at what pieces you can support them on. I mean, if you don't come in with a whole complement of support, then, then where's the hope? Until you work upstream, until we're working with people and making, making sure they don't go into that dead end of addiction, um, you know, we're, it's gonna be damage control. Yeah. Do you honestly think that you can end homelessness? When I say end homelessness, or that we, that we uh, do a lot better on addictions and for treatment, uh, there's just so much more that can be done. And, and can we ever get all the way there and into utopia? Uh, let's be realistic. It's not, it's not going to be like that. We've got to have shelters and housing options that are, uh, that are permissive and that take, take people from where they are and uh, meet them where they're at. Good luck. Do I believe you will succeed? I wish I could. But the fact is, in the heart of my perfect city exists a 10 block hell of drugs, death, disease, and destitution. Despite billions spent on services for the homeless, they have not slowed the plague of addiction. It is this self-imposed slavery that perpetuates homelessness. And it's a slavery that no government, no doctor, and no bed will ever end. Only they themselves can do it. Most die before they get the chance. So. If 
you come here. If you come here. If you come here. And get addicted. And get addicted. And get addicted. You stay here. You stay here. You do stay here. Because these are the streets of plenty. Thank you.